my, my parents were supposed to be here, but they got COVID. And, and my dad was going to present. So I'd like to just say a few words about my father. Yeah. The business of turning boys into men is no little thing. And the scouts have done an amazing job in that regard for over a century. And I wasn't the easiest kid to raise because uh, I'm eccentric. And my dad at first had a little trouble understanding me, but he was a fantastic dad. Uh, and my, 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 I was so blessed to have had the parents I had an absolutely idyllic childhood. I grew up on 80 acres, just like Tom Sawyer up there. We had a forest, we had ponds, we had a little lake my dad built. One day, we just brought a bulldozer in and decided to build a lake without any permission. <laughs> but we connected the best in scouting. He was a scout leader, and he did the hiking, the camping, the rock climbing. I learned sailing, which became my, my greatest passion of all, even the so passing the wood. I owe so much to scouting. I know my final merit badge was the survival merit badge, and of course I outdid everything always. So, you know, it's a winter camping trip, they had to go a mile from the troop. You had to build your shelter, so I built like an igloo, and it had, I think, you know, it had a part of it. Okay, and it made it all snow. And then, in the middle of the night, it started raining in February, right? And it was before you know what, I was drenched, and it was literally a matter of life and death. I remember that the Thompson twins were each 350 pounds. We're, we're sleeping together in the and I remember and I ran all the way. I dove in there, got in between them, I survived. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've been very fortunate to have won a lot of awards in my life and to have accomplished quite a few things. But I think the most important thing I want to talk about is scouting is what I learned in that survival marathon. Is what happens when everything goes the fuck wrong. Yeah. You know? When you, when you lose everything on earth that people say is important. But through scouting, you haven't lost your inner core. You haven't lost your values. You haven't lost the love of your children, the love of your parents. You have everything still. You know that as a result of the way you were brought up through this kind of formation of men, good men from boys. Now I know everybody's interested in those rivalry years because they were exceptional. It was a property that was falling to pieces at the time. Um, and I just, with your permission, I'd like to read you a quick little story on this just on one page. It would, I think, will satisfy everyone's curiosity the best in that way. So, here we go. I had a, 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 a racing bike, a green, Celestine green racing bike from Bianchi that I had been around as a boy. And I rode that thing for thousands and thousands of miles. And then it came time to go to college. And then finally, 10 years after that, I arrived at the Ryan Inn and still had the bike in storage. So the story picks up here. During the decade after college, when I apprenticed under a good number of the world's best chefs, the green bicycle made only infrequent appearances. After all, we were working 18 to 20 hour days. Sometimes, though, the urge to ride would call. I, would, I even bought one of those frames that allows you to ride the bike indoors, but more often it would be trotted out of the closet to serve as some sort of hermetic sculpture. It's so not until I arrived at the Rivalry in 1991 that the green bicycle seemed to hold more promise than long. The Somerset Hills, the idyllic back roads, and the riding trails along trout streams all that in the part of Jose Alibi. Now it must be mentioned that the decade of apprenticeship was one of severe financial hardship. My routine having been to work one 50-hour per week job at a three-star restaurant for money, minimum wage. 
while also working another 50 hour job for free in a four star restaurant for the training. So when I finally appeared at the front door of the Rhyland, I was well into six figures of debt, most of it being school old from Yale, and I was well accustomed to scarcity. Well, the Rhyland itself had been during those same 10 years sliding into financial ruin. At the time, the restaurant was running at 125% loss on sales. Deferred maintenance was necessarily a high art form. The youngest air conditioning unit was a 1942 Worthington. The kitchen equipment was on average 45 years old. And when it rained heavily outside, it also rained heavily inside five of the eight dining rooms. We were, as it seemed, two foundlings reunited. In desperation, the owner offered to make me a full equal partner if only I could stop the energy and just play a deal. The devil's deal had provided. I could do anything I wanted, except that I could have no money from him nor, nor either bar or from a bank. Everything would have to be done in cash. Now, the restaurant was rated zero stars by the New York Times, an official floor. And the kitchen stoves consisted of a single 35 year old six burger and another four months, which was only 25 years old. Grossly inadequate for the task of a restaurant with 250 chairs inside and another 250 houses. So the first $100 of profit was used to buy a square of pig iron cut to exact fit and laid across the floor. Now we had a flat top. 11 men would stand in the three foot by eight foot four space before these two stoves. They all had to stand sideways in order to fit. All were working 20 hour days. All were in spent galley before him. They were heavy times. Within the first four weeks, we had our first four star review. And the restaurant was filled with customers. And every day, there was another $100 of profit, maybe 200. First, a single copper pot. How we revered it, then another, then another. Because we had been using pie tins with clothes pins for pots. Then one box of the motion plates, 12 of them, now cooking tools, pelletics, out knives, whisk, mixing bowls, the world was our oyster. Suddenly in the sixth or seventh week, I heard a sound so disheartening, it brought dread. I could hear the grinding of the bearings of the motor to the exhaust hood. Oh my God, if the motor blows, we are dead in the water. I summoned the handyman Bob to survey the situation. The report was terrifying. The motor had been pulled so many times that there'd be no saving it again. How much a new one? Dreadful, even crisis would cringe. It would take every penny of profit for the next three weeks to replace it. Would the motor hold out that long? He promised to get right at it. Three days later, oh, sorry, fearing the worst, since we could not afford the replacement of the fit motor set, but the restaurant had been serviced in 1930, might there not be some other motor lying about that we could hook up? If we could only create some sort of transaxle to the shaft, like a power takeoff, so we could run a pulley system or a chain gun, he promised to get right at it. Three days later, he brought forth the product of the track. If memory serves, it might have been fashioned from junkyard riding motor motor parts. We tried it on the shaft perfectly. But what about a motor? Still running. Further searches. Then a moment of inspiration. A kitchen rooftop to walk. The plan was born. Still five days to go until enough funds to buy the new motor. And we were facing the dreadful Saturday. And it happened. Flames, smoke, screeching of the barracks. Quick! Shut up all the stoves. You run into the handy. You fetch my bicycle. You hit the stand. You grab the ladder. Within minutes, the burning motor was removed from the shaft. The transaxle with its newly fitted chain stock had attached in the motor's place. A green bicycle was set on the smaller stand very close by. And connecting the bike's drive socket to the fan shaft transaxle with a very long bicycle chain, four standard chains, and you have to go with one extra long. No, boys! We'll take turns, pedal for your lives. <laughs> <laughs> for the next few days and nights during service, the cooks would alternate rooftop detail, pedaling to exhaustion, keeping the violin alive. Inside, the lucky ones would cook, would cook with renewed appreciation for what we did. On the following Wednesday, the new motor arrived, much clamor of joy. 
heirs with the spirit, the gods profane, and the brave, brave green bicycle removed from alone. And all the excitement sound of the bicycle was misplaced and never seen again. It is one thinks likely serving some new master, painted no doubt in some ignominious color of the Celeste Green.